Welcome to the Unit 24 video that deals with the gas laws, the relationships between pressure, volume, and that sort of thing for gases. We're not going to go into every possibility there could be. We're going to look at how these things work a little bit. You're going to find a little bit of math in this one toward the end, <coughs> but it hopefully won't, won't be too bad. And in the end, it's going to come down to just a couple of gas laws we look at and being able to manipulate those relationships some. Uh, so we'll start with looking at our definition and our, what our units are that we talk about in terms of pressure. We'll look at what we call the simple gas law. It's Boyle's law, Charles' law, we have some Avogadro's law, number, names like that. And we'll get something called the ideal gas law. We fundamentally have really two gas laws we'll get out of this. One of them comes out of all these simple gas laws and comes into one law. And the other one is a little bit different, deals with how many moles of things that we've got. I would be helpful for you to take a look at unit 6.6 .6 and 6.7 before you take a look at this slideshow. So uh, you can see a FET simulation will be coming up here. Let's talk about the pressure definition, the change in volume effect. And so, so what we look at in here is a pressure is defined to be the force exerted on an area divided by the area. So think about an area like a square inch, square meter, whatever it's going to be. Your most familiar example of this is probably if you ever go to the air pump and put air in your tires, you talk about PSI or pounds per square inch. <coughs> Excuse me. Pounds is the unit of force. A pound is the unit of force. A square inch is the unit of area. So if I take the pounds and I divide them by the area, I'm actually getting a pressure out of that. So PSI is a very nice, clear pressure unit. It's how much force you have divided by the area. So what happens, and we'll see the simulation cranking up here pretty soon, uh, is that these particles will be swinging around. I think we've already seen this one once before, but these particles will be going around this box. They'll be hitting that wall. And every time a particle hits the wall, it exerts a force on it. And if you take that force and divide it by the area, you're going to help with the pressure for that container. Now, you might think, and keep in mind, that in this container there are billions of gas particles hitting the walls. It's sort of an average thing that we're looking at. But the pressure comes from the particles actually hitting the walls. Normal atmospheric pressure is something we talk about. For us, it actually amounts to about 14.7 pounds per square inch. When you go get your tire, you say, oh, my tire is flat. Your tire is probably not really flat. It's got in it 14.7 PSI, but it needs to have a lot more than that to actually hold your car up. So let's take a look at uh, what, we're, what we're trying to put together here. When we talk about a gas, there's really four different variables, four properties we like to think about in terms of measuring things. One is the pressure, how much pressure does a gas exert? Second one is the volume. What is the volume of the container that the gas is in? T is the temperature of the gas. <coughs> and then N is the number of moles of the gas. So we have those four properties to work with. If I have a sample of gas and I change any one of those, I'm going to necessarily change the others. And so we want to know something about how do they change? What is that relationship we're going to look at? So I made this little diagram down here to kind of show you how they link together. Here's pressure, here's temperature, here's volume, and here's number of moles. And you can see that all sorts of different possible combinations come out of this. And yeah, we're going to look at to start with is really uh, the process you might think about in trying to figure out how these go together is I have I could look at pressure, temperature, and volume all at the same time. But if I have three variables, it gets very confusing to start with. So what I'd like to do is take and think about just pairs of variables to start with, leaving the other two constants. So for example, I could look at pressure and temperature, and I could leave volume and number of moles the same, and that would mean that I'm getting some idea about the relationship between pressure and temperature without worrying about what's happening on the other side. And so we'll look at this in a few little experiments to kind of get a picture of how we could develop these gas laws, and then we'll kind of jump to the, where we get to the gas laws themselves instead of having to go through the whole, the whole business to get there. So <clears throat> we'll go ahead and use a FET simulation again. We've used these before. And what I want to do is take a look at this one. And we're going to look at, um, well, different types of pairings of variables in here. So this is the link for it down here. This right here is the link for it. I'll also put that in the blackboard item so you actually click on that link and go to here if you want to. What we're going to do is use this simulation. And the first thing we're going to look at is what is the effect of more particles on the pressure? So let me pull up the simulation and give you an idea of what we can do here. Oh, I got lots of things. And here's a here's the simulation itself. And so in the simulation, what you'll see is you have a gas pump, which you can use to put particles into that container. You have a pressure gauge here to tell us what the pressure is in terms of atmospheres. A thermometer to tell us what temperature is in terms of Kelvin. And you have a little scuba guy here that can push the volume in and out uh, and change the volume here. We're going to look at first is <laughs> we're going to look at what is the effect of between particles and pressures. So if I leave 
the volume constant and I leave the temperature constant and I just change how many particles I have in here, what happens to my pressure? That's the idea. So let's take this thing and I'm going to take the pump hand. No, I'm not going to. I'll type in over here. So I go to where it says heavy species over here. I'm going to type in and say we're going to start with 100 molecules. So I put 100 into the box there. And I click on this, and now you'll see that I love the way pattern the way it come out. I don't know that gas molecules would really do that, but it's kind of fun to look at. What you might notice as you look at this is the scuba guy is all the way back here, so the volume is not changing at all. The temperature is 300 Kelvin, so it's pretty well fixed. And what you'll see is we have 100 particles in here. And our pressure right now is something like 0.5. I mean, I point five five something around there. It varies a little bit. If I put lots and lots of particles in, it smooths out a lot. Let's do this so it's a little more visual for us. So I put those in there, and so I have about 0.5 to, let's say, for the pressure if I have 100 particles. So the question here is what happens if I take and I change my 100 to 200? So I'm going to double how many particles I have in, and let's see what happens to pressure. So we're at 0.5253. Put these more particles. You see them get blown into there. Now I've got... 100 part, 200 particles inside the container. What's happening to my pressure? He's going up to about 1.1, 1.01, 1 1.02. We started out like 0 0.52, 0 0.53. We'd expect then the number looks like here. This is really almost like doubled, right on the nose doubled. It means if I took and I doubled the number of particles in here, then I actually doubled my pressure, keeping the temperature the same, 300 Kelvin, keeping the scuba guy in the same place, keeping the volume the same. And so it turns out that if I double the number of particles under those conditions, constant temperature and constant volume, if I double the number of particles, I double the pressure. If I increase the number of particles by a factor of 10, the pressure will go up by a factor of 10. So I have a nice relationship that develops between those two variables. And when I take a look at it, Take a look at it. Let's take a look at what some of these things are that are happening. Let's look at some questions. What happens if the pressure for the number of particles is doubled? I should say doubled there. It goes up by two. Okay. On a particle level, how would you explain that particle pressure behavior? So if I increase the number of particles, why does the pressure go up? I don't hear anything. Why does the pressure go up? Well, Pressure goes up because when I double the number of particles, I have twice as many particles hitting the wall. They're exerting twice the force. So my pressure is going to end up doubling. So along the lines of the statement you can make is when the number of particles doubles the constant temperature, the pressure also doubles. But you could change that out and say triples, quadruples, gets cut in half, gets cut in a tenth. Any of those things would work. So it's a sort of relationship where these two variables go in the same direction we call a direct proportionality. So when we look at this relationship here, this is a direct proportionality because as my number of particles goes up, so does my pressure. As my number of particles goes down, so does my pressure. So we can say mathematically, as you may have seen, this is a proportionality. That's a little Greek alpha in here. It says pressure is proportional to the number of moles. It doesn't mean it equals that. Okay, But the number of particles is related to number of moles. I can talk about either one. It doesn't say those two are equal, it says they're related in a direct way, so if I double one, the other one doubles as well. Sometimes you'll see that replaced with pressure is equal to a small constant here times n, where we'll just get rid of the alpha, the proportionality, and say here's what it is, there's some multiplier that makes this statement true. So what we find now is particles and pressure go in the same direction. So let's take a look at the change in volume on pressure. So we can go back to simulation now. Like this, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to reset it. We want to look at volume on pressure, what the effect of volume changes on pressure. So let's put in, uh, let's put in like 50 particles or something like this. Uh, put 50 in here. And what we want to do is we want to look at volume and pressure. We're going to keep the temperature the constant. We don't want the temperature changing in this process. This is a simulation that does goofy things sometimes. So we'll tell the temperature not to change and we'll see how well it works out. So over on this guy, you notice the pressure here is, oh, about 0.3, right around 0.3 atmospheres. So the question is, if I take this guy and I move him in here, what's going to happen to my pressure? Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? If I make my volume smaller, what happens to my pressure? And let me put something out here so we can get a little bit of a sense. I'm going to put a ruler out. And the ruler, I'm just going to stick it along here. So what we'll do is we'll take and we'll cut the volume in half so we have some nice numbers to work with. Okay, so I'm going to come into here. And this guy here is a 0 to 
great, 6.6 .6 nanometers. So that means what I'm going to do is push this wall up until it's at like 3.3, .3, somewhere in here. That'll be cutting the volume in half. So if I do that and watch the pressure, it's at 0 0.24, 0 0.25 right now. If I take this guy and I move him in until he's at 3.3, .3, not quite there yet. Right there, move him in at 3.3. .3. What I find happening is now my pressure is running about 0 0.2, 0 0.50, 0 0.55. It's running about double of what it ran when I had the larger volume. So it's still that kind of the same proportionality. It's if I cut this in a factor by a factor of two, my pressure goes up by two. You might imagine if I cut the volume by a factor of ten, the pressure go up by a factor of ten. You can carry away with this. I don't know if we can in here, but I keep squeezing in on it. What I find out, if I keep squeezing in on it, I find out that, oh, I can't do it in here. Um, if you have enough particles in there, it actually blows the lid off. And those temperature here, the temperature kind of went up and down, and the ice cubes came out and cooled it down. It's, I told it to stay constant temperature, so it's coming back to 300 Kelvin again. And now I've moved it in here, and now if I do the proportionality of my volume, I'm going to find out it's the same as the pressure change. Okay, so what happens here, what's different here, is in the case of particles and pressure, they went in the same direction, but now in this case, when my volume goes down, my pressure goes up, they go in opposite directions. So let's see what that means for us mathematically. What that means for us, uh, let's go back to the questions. We reduced the volume to one half, what was the effect on the pressure? The pressure doubled. It's the opposite to that observed for the number of particles. And so how would you explain this volume pressure behavior on the particle level? Well, think of it this way inside that smaller container, these the gas molecules are still moving the same speeds they were before, they're going to hit twice as often, twice as frequently, so the same second, twice as many will hit as before, so what you end up with is you end up with a higher pressure. And then uh, the statement might be along the lines when the volume is reduced to one half its original value, the constant temperature number of particles, the pressure inside the container doubles, Similar to what we did before, before particles and pressure went in the same direction, now volume and pressure go in opposite directions. The other one we call the direct proportionality, and this thing what we call this is we call an inverse proportionality right here, or inverse relationship. Whether you know that for gases or not, it's not a bad sort of pattern to look for in several things, even in uh, things outside of chemistry, to kind of see what those relationships look like. So we can write it here like we did before, but now we'll say that the pressure is proportional to 1 over V. Notice that when my volume got cut in half, my pressure doubled. 1 divided by 1 half is 2. Okay. And we can also write an equality uh, where M is a, is a constant and it looks something like this, or you can actually rearrange that and say PV is equal to M. We'll see that one coming up later on. And so you'll see this one written very often, PV equals M being a constant. So if I took that container and I could change the volume all over the place and the pressure all over the place, as long as I keep the temperature constant, number of moles constant, that M would have the same value, and that means that if I start with one pressure and one volume and multiply them together, I'll get the same product when I look at a second pressure and a second volume, as long as I keep temperature and number of moles the same. This one is famously called Boyle's Law, who actually studied it quite a bit and stated it way back in 1662. Gas was really easy things to study back then, because you can have nice volumes of it, you can do quite a few things, measure pressure. It's harder to study liquids and solids. So let's look at the volume temperature relationship. So here's what's going to happen here is let's go back to our simulation and we want to look at the volume temperature relationship. So what we might think about is, let's see, what this means is we want to have constant pressure and constant number of particles. It's not hard to get a constant number of particles. It's really not hard to do that. We just keep the same ones in there we have now. That's going to be fine. But I want to keep the same pressure. So here's what I might think about. I have this guy pulled back. I'm going to pull him all the way back to the starting point here. Like that. Okay. Now we already know that if I take it and cut this in half, that my pressure is going to just about double, right? What I want to do in this experiment is understand the relationship between volume and temperature, which means pressure is going to be constant. Well, if I do this to it, and move me in here to 3.3, like this. Move me in here to 3.3. That's half the volume, right, that I had to start with. Look at my pressure. My pressure's up 0.54. How do I get my pressure back down to 0.25 or 0.26 or whatever it was? Well, the only thing I can do <coughs> is I, I can't take particles out. They have to be the same. What I can do is I can cool it down here. So I can take this guy in here. Oops. I didn't want constant... I didn't want constant temperature, I wanted constant 
pressure. There we go. Okay, constant pressure. Okay, so I got there. And now what I'm going to do is take it, I'm going to cool this thing and see what temperature I have to go down to. What's my temperature I have to drop to in order for my pressure to drop back to 25.25 uh, atmosphere? So we're going to take and cool him down some by putting little ice cubes up there. We all know that works well. And we want to get him down to about 0.25-ish or so, somewhere in that vicinity. We're going to start slowing up a little bit. It takes a while to set and situate. So let's go sit here at 150 Kelvin right now. And if I look at my, I started out 300, right? Oh, what happened to my 3.3? .3? My 3.3 .3 was back here, wasn't it? Would you quit that? Here. No, 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 no. Here, I'm going to take the pressure off here. That's messing me up. Move it back to 3.3. .3. Right there, that's my halfway point. And now if my temperature at 141 Kelvin, what do you see? Now I'm going to add just a tiny bit of this to make it, a little tiny bit of heat to make it work out perfectly for us because we can do that as a simulation. And here's what you got. It's the pressure at this point is 0.26 atmospheres. So what we started with, we started at 300 Kelvin, but we started with twice the volume. So if I take the volume and I cut it in half, then I also have to cut the temperature in half in order for it to keep the same pressure. Okay. What kind of relationship is that? Both going the same direction? What kind of relationship is that? That's another one of these direct relationships, like the pressure number of particles, V is proportional to T, or you say V is equal to some constant times T, or if you re rearrange it, uh, sorry, maybe that, rearrange it back here, <clears throat> you say V over T is equal to some constant, or again, similar to Boyle's Law, you can come up with this and say it looks something like this, and this is an example we call Charles' Law. Okay. Now, you know, Charles is interesting. Charles, Charles is a hot air balloon, so he kind of likes his gas things. You want to know about those. And, and got to study it quite a bit. <clears throat> so you put these all together and you're saying, what in the world am I going to do with this? So what do I have to know? What, what's going to be important to me? Well, here's what comes up. <clears throat> is If we go back and look at Boyle's Law, Boyle's Law told us that P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Charles' Law tells us that V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So I put those two together, I get this law, where I don't have the number of moles, and the number of moles are going to stay constant. I don't have a gas leak, and I have, don't have anything being made in terms of gases inside of there. So this relationship here is very important for us because it tells us the relationship between those six variables, the three before and three after some kind of a change. Um, it's called the combined gas law. <clears throat> now in the combined gas law, important things to notice. The units you use for pressure, here's pressure on the left, here's pressure on the right. doesn't matter whatsoever what units of pressure I use. They'll cancel out. If you want to make up your own unit of pressure and name it after yourself, you could use it. <clears throat> Just use it on both sides and it'll cancel out, and that's good. Second thing, volume. Over here, over here. As long as they use the same volume units, it doesn't matter. It could be liters, it could be milliliters, it could be cubic centimeters, it could be cups, it could be teaspoons, it could be whatever it is. If you want to make up again your own unit and name it after yourself, that's fine. As long as it's the same on both sides, it's not a problem. So it would seem logical then that temperature has the same deal going on. Well, it turns out that temperature does not have the same deal going on. The temperature has to be in the Kelvin scale. It has to be in an absolute temperature scale. So when we talk about, we, we took temperature and dropped from 300 to 150, that cut the temperature in half. Okay. If you look at those temperatures in Celsius, 300 Kelvin is about, oh, about 30 Celsius, somewhere around there. But 150 Kelvin is a whole bunch, but it's not half of it. <laughs> okay, so the Celsius scale doesn't work in here. The Fahrenheit scale doesn't work in here. You can't put them in and fix them later. They have to go in in the absolute scale in terms of uh, Kelvin. Okay. So, and down here, as I point out, uh, when you're looking for missing information, it's not too hard to do these. They all kind of look the same, just about. If I don't know what T2 is, what I might do is I might take, and you may have seen solving these by crossing, multiplying, cross multiplying, dividing. So I can multiply this by T2, multiply that by T1, and then just divide out, and there we get. So down below is where I show the detail on that. So let's take a look now at some sample problems and see what happens in sample problems. So I have a gas here. It's all drawn out very neatly, but I'm going to try to do it uh, a little less neatly, which probably isn't going to be too hard. Um, if I can find my camera, there it is. Okay, 
So this is even convenient because I can show you the problem at the same time we're doing this and I can hide the actual work. So I apologize for the lighting. It's not professional lighting. It's my overhead lamps at the dining room table. We have a sample of gas originally in three atmospheres. Oops. Get back here. Okay. So we have um, three. I guess I can't do that. Okay. Things you learn. Three atmospheres of gas, 250 kelvins, heat of 350 kelvin, constant volume, what's its new pressure? So one of the things you can do in these solving these problems is write down the information you have so it starts to look kind of like those two laws, the combined gas law or the ideal gas law. So what we've got in here is I've got a sample of gas originally at three atmospheres. So when it says originally at we can call it we'll call it P1. 3.0 atmospheres. Doesn't help a lot when I write. Okay, it looks like that. And that 250 Kelvin. So my temperature to start with is 250 Kelvin. Okay. Then we're going to heat it to 350 Kelvin. So when I say I'm going to heat to that, my second temperature is 350 Kelvin. Looks like that. What I want to know about is what is his new pressure. So what you'll notice in here is I'm changing conditions. I'm changing my pressure, changing my volumes, changing that kind of thing. So our gas law of choice would probably end up being the one that says P1, V1 over T1. We only have two. This one, the combined gas law, looks like that. And so one of the things I can do is write out like that and say, well, wait, way too many variables down here. But notice my pressure and temperature change. I didn't say anything about the volume, which means the volume was implied as being the same. So since the volume is the same, since V1 and V2 are the same, so since those two are the same, I don't have to worry about writing them in there. I can just say that P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Okay, it looks like that. And all I have to do is go back in and put in my number. So over here, I know this is three atmospheres. Is my P1. My T1 is 250 Kelvin. That equals my, T, my P2, which I don't know. That's what I'm trying to find, divided by 350 Kelvin. So what I have to do is solve this thing to figure out what my P2 is. And one of the quickest ways of seeing this is if I take and multiply both sides by 350, both sides by 350 Kelvin, it's going to cancel out here and it tells me P2 is equal to 350 Kelvin times three atmospheres divided by 250 Kelvin. Voila, and there comes your answer. All you do is take 350, multiply it by 3, and your calculator divide by 250. You don't have to write anything down in between. Put in 350, hit the time sign, put in 3, hit the divide by sign, and put in 250. And hit the equals button, and you'll be all set. Or you may have to hit the equals button, I don't remember. Okay, so, so that's an example of how that works. Now come down in here, and this has got more words. It's three lines compared to the two lines in the other one. But let's take a look at it like this again and I'm going to take it over here there you go so in this one though what I've got is a sample of gas is originally at a temperature of 350 Kelvin a volume of 45 liters and a pressure of six and a half atmospheres. It's giving me all three variables to start with don't panic okay what you say is okay my temperature is initially 350 Kelvin my volume is at 45.0 liters, and my pressure is 6.5 atmospheres. And these are all ones, T1, V1, and P1. And it says, what temperature is the gas at if the volume is changed to 650 liters? 650 liters, oh, sorry, 65.0 liters. Get your numbers right, too. It'll help. 60 there, and my T2 is what I'm trying to find out. What does that temperature got to be for this to be true? And my pressure then is 8.0 atmospheres. Okay, so in that case, I have all six of those things I'm, I'm either looking for or I've got already. So I go back to my combined gas law. In my combined gas law, it tells me P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. And so if you're a symbol type of person like you do it in symbols, you're trying to find T2, right? So you could cross multiply T2 over here. So you could say P1, V1 times T2 
times T2 equals P2 V2 times T1. All you do is multiply this over here and that over there. It looks like that. We want to solve for T2. So T2 will just be P2 V2 T1 over P1 V1. Looks something like that. Another way you can solve these, it might make your life easier, depending on what your level is, comfort level is with some of the arithmetic things, is notice in this expression here that I know P1, V1, T1. I know all three of those, don't I? So I can take and figure out what that number is. I can take my six, six and a half times my 45 divided by my 350. That's a number, isn't it? And then over on this side, I have P2 times V2. I know what those are. I can multiply those. And I just have this number here equals that number divided by T2. And it might make it easier for you to solve it from there. Okay, so that's those are just examples of how we can do those types of problems. And then the last gas law we'll take a look at is called the ideal gas law. And the ideal gas law, it actually brings in a number of moles. It actually lets us deal with what if. We want to know how many molecules and moles we have. What if we, you know, what are we, what's going to happen here? And so the ideal gas law looks like this thing in the middle of the page. PV equals nRT. Notice there's not a subscript one, subscript one or two or anything here. This is one set of conditions. So the ideal gas law is we're talking about one set of conditions, one pressure, volume, temperature. There's that and one set of numbers of moles. The R that you have in here is that constant. Remember we had constants before shown to proportionalities. These are the, this is a constant that comes from all of that. And this constant ends up having a value of 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over mole times Kelvin, which is not too hard. Uh, well, it's, that's something you want to have written down <clears throat> when you have to work with it. Once you get to the point where you've got it memorized, then you're wasting brain cells. And I, believe me, I've got it memorized. So um, this is a different case. This one, we're not looking at changing conditions. This one, we're looking at we're fixed set of conditions. We don't know something. There are four variables here, pressure, volume number of moles, temperature. And so if I know three of those, I can find the fourth. We come over here and look at this particular page. Uh, let's take a look at... Top question is, what's the pressure of half a mole of gas? Confined so my N um, is a half a mole. My volume is 110 liters. My temperature is 325 Kelvin. And we want to know what's the pressure going to be. So this is what we're after. So my pressure equals, sorry, my pressure times volume equals my number of moles times R times T. So my pressure now, right here, is just equal to NRT over V. So all I can do is plug in my half a mole for number of moles. My R is 0 0.08206. Like that. And multiply by temperature, which is 325 Kelvin, and divide by uh, V. And so it uh, it works out pretty well. Okay, and yeah, and here's another example down here. What's the volume one mole? And it goes on from there. And so basically, um, we have two laws out of this whole thing. We've got the ideal gas law, and we have the combined gas law. Here's my summary slide. Combined gas law looks like this. Changing conditions, same number of moles. If you change the moles, you can't use the combined gas law. Down in the ideal gas law, one set of conditions relates all four variables to each other. And that is unit 24.